here today and thank you for joining us. Just got a notification to say this meeting's being recorded. So um, just to let you all know, this uh, is being recorded for people who can't make it today. Um, so just be aware if you do have your camera on that, that we are recording. So I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Nick Shepherd, and ordinarily I am the Business Development and Partnerships Manager at the Business Growth Hub. However, today I am wearing my future Pro Manchester hat. Um, and in fact, I'm so pleased to announce that I've recently been invited to become the chair of our future Pro Manchester Committee. So for those that don't know, the Future Pro Manchester Committee is here to provide development opportunities for the next wave of regional talent under the pillars of education, connection and socialising. And coming soon into the new year, um, we're really excited to be launching our brand new mentoring scheme as well. Um, however, today we're here to talk about our flagship event. Um, the Made in Manchester Awards, or more commonly known as the MEMAS. So the MEMAS recognises the achievements of young professionals across Greater Manchester, across 17 um, varied categories. To be shortlisted is a huge achievement and to win an award can be a huge springboard in your career. Now, writing a nomination isn't an art form. However, there are certain tips and tricks which you can learn to write an award winning nomination. So where word count is limited, how do you get the most out of a nomination? To answer that question, um, I'm delighted to be joined here today by some of our judges to tell us what they look for uh, in a nomination and some of our past winners to tell you what they did. So on the judges side, we've got Chris Bagley from Together Money. Um, we've got Rebecca Rainsworth from, um, sorry, we've not, wrong way around. We've got Alison Loveday from LLM Solicitors and then um, on the winner's side we've got Rebecca Hainsworth from Brown Jacobson and Fiona King from Nettle Hospitality. So if we start with the judges first um, and for those that haven't been through this process before the um, MEMA nomination um, stages is in two stages. So you submit a nomination first and then successful um, applicants are shortlisted and then you receive um, an interview from the judges um, where they then select the winner. So if we go stage by stage and look at the application first, um, I suppose the most obvious question is, what does stand out to you most in an, in an award winning applicant nomination? So yeah, do you want me to pick that one up, Nick? Sure, yes, please. Yeah, so um, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's Chris Bagley. Um, so just probably what's and all, really. I've, I've been a judge for about seven, eight years um, within MEMA. So I think one of the things that I really want to get across to everybody is when, when you're going through um, the award nominations, that, that you are faced as a judge with a lot of nomination entries to go through. Um, and to be honest, it's quite hard work um because it's a lot of reading you spend a lot of time and investing a lot of time into each one um so the thing for me is um number one they're often stronger when they're written by yourself um sometimes we get nominations made by other people within your business um if i'm honest they probably don't land as strongly um so i would seriously recommend that you probably enter the award uh, yourself and i think it's quite hard really because um, it's, it's quite difficult to talk about how good you are um, and how successful you've been in the year, but it's quite hard to write about it. But this is not a time to be modest. Um, I think you just need to get across um, the real successes that you've had during the year. But, but also what's really good to read sometimes is be very open and honest to some of the challenges that you've faced. Uh, it's not all about painting an amazing picture. Just be really honest about some of the challenges that you've had. Um, but it is very, very difficult to write uh, when you're talking about yourself. I think what's really good as well is, and I know some of the people who've uh, put themselves forward within Together have done this, once you've written it and you've got it to a certain point, ask people around you, ask your, your manager, ask your colleagues um, to be really critical about your entry. Um, almost ask them to pull it apart because it needs to tell a story. Um, it's all very good talking about how many new transactions you've done, how many deals you've been involved with, you know, the numbers, but that's almost a bit of a given. What, what I'm looking for or what a lot of the judges are looking for is, is really telling a story to set yourself apart. So um, give plenty of time um, to write it, but give plenty of time for people around you to vet it and sort of critique it. Um, 
because when you're reading sort of 10, 12 entries for a particular category or sometimes more, um, you just want to see stuff that stands off the page. So that, that would be my sort of opening, really, uh, opening advice. Thank you. And then um, if we come to you, Alison, and for the same question. Yeah, great. So I think Chris has pretty much nailed it. I completely agree with the uh, recommendation that you write the entry yourself. That doesn't mean to say you shouldn't get help. And I think before you put pen to paper, it probably is worth having those conversations with colleagues and ask them how they, how they rate you. What do they think that you've done really well? One of the uh, difficulties that I have as a judge, I've done it like Chris for several years now, I'm doing categories of apprentice and graduate. So they can be doing completely different types of job from social media to construction to trainee lawyers. So, and often we get a lot of entries. Mine are typically over 20. So if I'm investing the time to go through them, I'm also expecting time to be being put into the entry itself. Some people um, maybe don't appreciate that. So they're, they perhaps think they'll get a nod through and they'll uh, shine at the interview. In fact, they won't get through because they won't be shortlisted if they haven't really spent the time getting their application. As Chris said, you're looking for a differentiator. If you've got 20 and you've got to, got to, to bring it down to sort of half a dozen, then you're looking for those um, exceptional things that catch your eye. And I guess my final point is, which mirrors uh, some of the, what Chris was saying, is it's not enough just to talk about your day job. That really is a given. So um, certainly on some of the more professional applications, we'll say trainees, solicitors and accountants, talking about the different seats that you've done um, isn't really going to make... Um, make that a, an interesting application. You want to know all of the other things. And I think certainly, I'm sure we'll get onto it with the winners. You wonder how many lives some of these candidates have because they're doing so much. And a lot of it is supporting colleagues, maybe supporting charities, but it's all the work that they're doing in the Manchester business community and their own sort of local communities over and above the job. So that's part of the story I would say that needs to be told. I suppose that's quite a nice follow on to my next question in that how important do you think it is for social value um, over profit to be present within an application? Because I think we can often have somebody that comes through and they've brought, say, a million pounds with a business in, but that's all they've done. So how important is, is that extra? Alison, do you want to take that one first this time? Yeah, I will do. Um... For me, I think it's increasingly important. I think it's increasingly important in business anyway. So I think the businesses that um, people, you know, there's a war on talent, you know, the talent want to go to those businesses that are able to talk to these sorts of things, not just social value, but things like sustainability. It's, it's pretty much an, an all round business requirement and that's then reflected in the candidates so I'm always interested to understand you know whether you call it social value it's it's what I just described really it's yes yes you're doing your day job you're doing your, your day job really well so you'll have the support of your manager from that point of view but actually what makes you the standout candidate and somebody that should be considered for MEMA is what else you were doing Great, yeah, thank you. I think just, just to kind of reinforce that, probably it's probably easy if I talk to you about sort of the, the journey that, that, that we've been on. I think, as Alison says, it's great to talk about the success of your business. Uh, and that in years gone by, that was always the key thing that kind of people looked out for. But actually how we measure our success now is actually the impact we're having on our social outreach, uh, our charity partners, the work we're doing outside of the BAU and the numbers and the, and the volume that, that we do every day. So that, that's something that I think more than ever now, you know, when you talk about um, social outreach, our purpose as a business, that's something that you really need to get across in your application. And that might not necessarily be something that you yourself have had a direct impact on, but it's important to include, obviously, the, the, 
you know, it's part of your role and it's part of your company's values. Um, it, it all goes back to when you're reading uh, nominations, it's all going back to something that actually sparks an interest and that is actually really interesting to read. There's no yeah. offence, you know, you read some nominations and the dull as dishwater, so no pressure, everybody. But, you know, it's, it's all about making it stand out and making it interesting and it not just being about the numbers and the BAU in your, in your business and your day job. So really, really think about that, that impact that you're having. And it might be not necessarily job related. It might be something that's an outside interest that you hold or an outside um, uh, passion that you hold that has a direct impact on your community or um, the people around you. Amazing, thank you. Um, and when it comes down to evidence, so to proving exactly how you back up the figures and you know the examples that you put in a present in a, a nomination i will keep calling it an application all the way through but just <laughs> i will keep correcting myself um i suppose speaking from being a judge at another awards recently i think some of the things which i saw coming through as evidence was well i won this award and i won that award and i think it's what evidence do you need to see um aside from that because to win another award you want to know how someone has got the evidence to win this one not what you did for the other one so yeah what kind of evidence do you look for uh well i certainly don't audit the numbers that they put on the nominations i think we have to <laughs> accept that people are telling yeah. the truth when they put themselves forward to nominate but i think i think the thing i'd say is don't get carried away by saying that you've directly impacted the success of your business and when i when i say that i mean don't, if your business has done you know 50 transactions over the last 12 months don't try and articulate the fact that you've been a part of the success of all those transactions because because nobody could have been so just just be modest at the same time don't don't try and over egg the numbers and the success um you know it's it's what I love to see is when people talk about the impact they've had on their colleagues around them and their team, rather than just, you know, I have solely been the person who's driven this. Uh, that's kind of, you want, you want to know that they're working collaboratively to, um, to promote the success. But in terms of you know, how, do we, how do we justify the numbers that people are putting down, it's really hard as a judge to, to audit, you know, sort of, pounds and pence but, but again they go back to saying what i said before that's probably not the thing that i'm really looking for in a nomination it's, it's the other stuff great and so what do you think by means of evidence do you think testimonials are useful from potential managers or clients do you think that they tip things over a little bit or does that not really do it for you if um if you read how to write a good nomination it'll always say put testimonials in um, <laughs> and testimonials are great but but if you're going to ask someone for a testimonial, don't get them just to put, you know, Dave is a really great bloke and he's done a really good job. Again, you want them to be highlighting something that's above and beyond. Yeah. Alison, have you got anything to add to that? Yeah, I would be um, more... I think it's good if you, if you can give examples of maybe the impact that you've had. So... Um, one of the ones that stands out for me was, and an, I think the lady won the Best Apprentice and she worked with deaf adults and she was able to talk uh, very cogently about um, how she took, um, sorry, that's for me, how she took um, a, an adult man to, to the bank to, so I'm going to go on mute, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. So we we'll 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 come back to that one if that's yeah. all right. Okay. Yeah. Um so I think we'll move on to the interview stage so that we've got enough time to uh, bring the winners in and talk about their experience. So in the interview, um a nominee only has 15 minutes to impress. So what are the key points you think that people should try and get across? And how important is it to be different from the application form and get new evidence in? Or is it about reiterating what was already in there? Um, it's a bit of both. Yeah. So I think one of the things that always surprises me, we, obviously we used to do these judging awards physically in a room in central Manchester. And, you know, when you walk into a room um, and you're faced with like four or five judges, it's quite daunting, especially if you've not done it before. 
Uh, it's a bit easier now because I think this year and the last couple of years, we've done it uh, virtually in this format on Teams. Um, so it's not quite as daunting. I think sometimes when you, you read a nomination entry and then when somebody comes on the screen, sometimes you can get a nomination entry that absolutely blows you away. And then when they actually come to the interview stage, you think, is this the same person? Um, and vice versa, sometimes you get a, a nomination entry that's, that's good, but it doesn't blow you away. And then when they actually come into the actual interview, they, they, they completely light up the room. I think the advice that I'd give anybody is you've got 15 minutes. It, it is really, really not a long time. You literally, you'll start speaking and it'll be over. Um, don't overthink it. Don't try and read off a script. Um, but just really bring out your personality. You've got 15 minutes to shine. So don't be sort of, you know, a monotone talking through your, your nomination. Try and really bring your personality to life when you've got that 15 minute slot. Um, because I can tell you some of the people that have, um, have won awards historically, the ones that have really done that and shown, um, shown the personality at the stage uh, when they've been interviewed. So put yourself out there a bit. And if you've got a, you know, we all, we all come to our, our jobs and do, do a great job. We're very professional and whatever else, but try and use that as a real opportunity to, uh, to bring out your personality. Somebody gave me some advice once and told me that I needed, this is years ago, by the way, told me that I needed to colour myself in, which basically meant, you know, it's great being professional, but you need to bring out your personal side. So try and colour yourself in when you get to the, uh, the interview stage, if you're successful. I like that. That's something I'm taking away today. Uh, Alison, have we... It was, was it a dog now. in the background? The joys, of, the joys of home deliveries. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll just finish uh, what I was saying. I, I was just saying yeah. previously was about making an, giving examples and the previous lady that was had taken a, a young man to the bank and, and she was able to act as his interpreter. And she described, you know, just then went on to talk about the impact that deafness has generally in our communities and how invisible it is and the lack of investment there is in, in, in charities and support for deaf people. So it really brought it to life um, for, the, for the judges. And I think that's what you need to do. And to link then with the, with the current question and what Chris was saying, I think it is really important um, that you are, you know, people talk about authentic, but that's what you're looking for. You're not looking for a mismatch between what you read and, and how they come across. Um, I think talking passionately, that's not your job and it's your outside interest. Talk about that. You, you need to, you know, bring yourself to life. And I think that um, I would practice because, I, because actually, if, if you're not doing a lot of, you know, actually being interviewed, you might, people might be doing, zoom calls with colleagues but they're not necessarily used to having questions in fact in a nice gentle way but they are going to be not necessarily questions they've expected they are going to be directed just at them um so it's worthwhile asking some colleagues to to take you know take some time out to do that because i think <clears throat> people do you know, not if you're a bit shy and you're a bit nervous um, then you probably have to take yourself out of your comfort zone a bit to, to give yourself the best opportunity in, in the process. Can I just add one bit to that? Because, yeah. I mean, Alison does a lot of sort of stuff on television and, you know, a lot of speaking and whatever else. And, and I've had to do my fair share, you know, in front of the rooms of, you know, quite a lot of people. Um, it, sometimes people are not used to it, especially, you know, when they're, when they're more young in their career. Um, but a really great tip is I find it really hard to practice um, in front of, I, I have done anyway, historically in front of other people, especially colleagues, because um, sometimes it's harder to present to colleagues than it is actually to present to, you know, a, some strangers or a, a room of strangers. One thing I do is if you've got certain things that you want to say in your interview, don't script it too heavily, but practice in your car. So... I drive to work when I've got a speech to do or a, or a uh, presentation to do. I talk to myself in the car because everyone thinks you're on hands free. You're that nutter. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but everyone thinks you're on hands free. Um, <laughs> you can just talk to yourself and almost pretend that when you get in your car to start off to drive to work, that you're going into your team's call with a load of judges. And just if you get your opening two or three minutes in your head, 
then straight away you'll the rest of it you'll just relax into it straight away so practice but but don't script it you know to the point of it being stayed and and not bringing out your personality but i always find that if i've got a big speech to do and i'm presenting to like 200 people or whatever then i just practice to talk to myself in the car i absolutely agree with that one mm -hmm. i do that and you know i think the first time you do it you feel daft and you just get used to it and then all of a sudden you're talking to yourself all the time but no it really 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 does help i, I do um, that anyway good. to be honest yeah myself constantly, so. <laughs> it's good thinking it. time yeah so i, um, I would just uh, just before we move on on that point yeah. i think to the point about not being too scripted i think that's right i think you should have you know some key things that you definitely want to say and some key examples but don't fall into the trap of trying to push what you want to say into a question that isn't relevant, which I've also seen. And somebody's got an example that they're desperate to give. So they give it to something completely inappropriate. So the, the interview then doesn't flow and you know people aren't um, using the information and evidence to best effect really. Yeah, yeah. great. So I suppose, are there any other uh, common mistakes that people make at the interview stage? Uh, common mistakes. Uh, don't be dull. Um, make sure that you get your room prepped because this is on teams. So a bit like today, make sure you give yourself plenty of time to find a room that's quiet where you're not going to get a delivery driver, you know, knocking <laughs> on the door like I was. Um, and just, just make sure that, you know, your surroundings are surroundings that you're comfortable in so that you feel comfortable that you can just sit and talk for 15 minutes. It's not the judging process when you get to the interview stage is not rocket science. It's no one's there, no one's there to trip you up. Nobody wants to see anybody fall over. Um, if you've not used, been used to doing it before, then just make sure that you, you prep and you, you know, you're not run into a meeting room to try and do it two minutes before you do on. Um, so yeah, just give yourself ample time to be prepared because the more comfortable you are behind the screen, um, the easier the conversational flow. And just on Alison's point, you know, don't make sure you understand the question. If you don't understand it, there's nothing wrong with just saying, sorry, I'm not quite sure what you mean. But don't be embarrassed or don't try and fluff it. Um, because your answers need to be relevant to what the judges are asking you. But they're not going to ask you anything that's like astrophysics. They're, they're going to be asking you, you know, why do you think, what sets you apart? from everybody else that's coming into the room or coming into the chat today. Why should you get the award over the other six people that have been shortlisted? And if you can answer that question passionately and enthusiastically, you're onto a winner. Great, thank you. So before we move on to our winners, are there any final closing points from, from either of you? Yeah, I was just going to say really that I would see my role as a judge is to allow the um, the candidate to shine, you know, definitely not trying to, to um, trip them up in any way, but ask some question, open questions that hopefully um, allow them to, to talk about themselves and give those examples and uh, bring their application to life. So last year when we started um, one of the calls, the candidate wasn't on the, wasn't on the camera. So I think Isabel went off and telephoned her and it, and it turned out this lady was on maternity leave, had no idea that she was even shortlisted and none of the emails or messages had got through to her. So she had no idea that we were about to interview her. But um, she very gamefully rang her mum around, <laughs> went around to look after the baby and we, um, we had her interview about an hour later and she did go on to win. So it didn't start off well, but um, you know, it ended well. So it doesn't, have to go, out, isn't it? it doesn't have, all have to go your way, but you can still do well. Yeah. Uh, Chris, have you got anything to add? No, just nope. just don't be nervous. It's not, it's like Alison says, there's, the judges are there to see you shine. So don't go on to it, you know, be nervous. Just go on to it as though you're having a conversation and you, you're bringing your nomination entry to life on the day. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, so I think and enjoy it. it. Make sure you enjoy it as well, because it's a nice thing to, you know, to, to be successful and through to the interview stage is is a real recognition in itself. These awards are, 
you know, get a lot of people who enter to get nominated is a massive thing in itself and people should be very proud if they get nominated but when you're at the interview stage just enjoy it yeah i think that's it it's an enjoyable process we all know that the night is amazing as well um so i think the takeaway from there is um, make sure you, you add layers it's it's about what's on top of the day job not just doing the day job well and um, it's about letting your personality shine through and it's about the time so both preparing the actual nomination and the time leading up to the interview as well to make sure that you're in that headspace um so no thank you for that and if um, i see 45 people talking in the car tomorrow on the way to work i know that they're all gonna be uh, <laughs> Thank you. So I think we'll move on now to um, our two uh, previous winners. Um, so we've got Fiona King from Nettle Hospitality and Rebecca Hainsworth from Brown Jacobson. Um, so to both of yourselves, um, Chris and Alison touched on this slightly, but would you recommend writing your own nomination or asking a colleague? So which approach did you both take? You want to go first? Or... Uh, I, I can get first. Yeah, so I, I wrote my own application. Um, I had a little bit, there was a little bit of discussion within our office as to I didn't know whether I had to write it and have someone submit it on my behalf or whether um, I would submit, submit it myself. So I actually wrote mine in the third person because I found it much easier to write about myself um, in the third person thinking from the perspective of someone nominating me but writing it myself so that that's how I did my one yeah that was the exact same tip I was going to give because I find it so difficult to write about my myself especially to kind of big yourself up even though you know what you've done is good um but writing it in the third person and then change I actually changed it back to first person and added what I felt was the personality to it that um, Chris was talking about, the the layers that I think made it sound like it had come from me. Um, so all the facts and the, yeah, the, the stuff that made me want to put that piece of work forward, um, I wrote in the third person as well. It makes it so much easier. Great, you're both very modest people. <laughs> um, so when you've got a limited word count um, on these nominations, how do you get the most out of that? And how do you decide yeah, what the best evidence is to put across? Um, so I just try to remember that someone is at the other end reading it. So as much as you want to go, like you could talk about your work all day, hopefully. Um, but if you're in a stack of 20 other applications, what, I mean, it's kind of like an elevator pitch, I guess. Um, so even if you start with 500 words, try and really edit yourself back down because um, even when you go back to read it yourself, um, you know, you, you're gonna get, not boring, but it's the ins and outs of what you do aren't as interesting to anyone else. So you need to, work really hard to pull out those bits that are interesting and that are relevant to the person reading it. So I'd say make sure you've given context to what you're talking about, but you don't need to explain the previous year that led to the context that you're giving. Um, so yeah, I think it is quite tricky to self-edit, but um, I think that's a really good way. Uh, you can test that by getting someone else to read it and see if they feel it's necessary you might feel like it's an important part of the story but actually it might not be yeah, yeah and I think we might say my first draft looked very very different to my eventual um what I eventually submitted and the way that if I sort of take you through where I started which was to write out you know I've done this and I've done this and you know you've got a question that's you know give an example of how you've been innovative in the last year or whatever and, and like loads of examples and then where I kind of edited that down to was to go well rather than giving loads of different examples is to just go in depth into one so like on my first question I went into really into depth and it's that point that Chris made about telling the story you know that gave me the opportunity to really tell the 
story about what I'd done and link it to that question. And then on the, the next question, it's like, well, I could have gone back to that example, but I've got another example from another project that I've worked on that, you know, and it's working out which is the right example for the right question and then really go into depth on that. And I, I also got other people to read um, read my submission and I'm a lawyer. I actually got some friends who are non-legal people to read because what I do is quite niche. Um, and I, I went from the perspective of, you know, this is um, the meme as a, a cross industry, you know, I'm, I mean, I was applying for the lawyer award, but even within that, I was like, well, what I'm going to, like my submission is about what I do, which is commercial work, but actually I'm going to be compared against people who are doing, um, you know, all sorts of different areas of law. And that's a really broad spectrum. So how can I get someone who's a judge who might not be familiar with even my area of law, even if they're a lawyer, to really understand what I'm talking about? And so it really benefited from having those, say, non-legal people looking at it um, and saying, you know, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand the story that I'm telling here, even as someone who has no context as, you know, either from legal or, or, or what I do? Um, and that really helped. And one of the big bits of advice that my, my friends gave me when they're reading it, but like the first draft where they're like, well, this is written as a lawyer. And, you know, it's like, you've got to, you've got to step away from, you know, how you would necessarily write things every day to really get into the mindset of you know I'm writing something that's got the the energy and the passion to come across to someone who maybe has no you know no context and no experience of what you do to really make that great first impression yeah so I suppose it's it's make it make sense and it has to I think we we can all talk in our language and in our world and does it make sense to somebody else? So no, I think that's a really good tip. Um, was this your first time applying for the Made in Manchester Awards or had you been through it before? And if you had, or any other awards, what lessons have you learned that led up to the win? <laughs> okay, um, so I hadn't applied for any other awards. Um, and I like I've done things in the past which are like, legal directories and things and never actually <laughs> managed to get myself. but like that seems like a whole other dark art um but yeah so I but I did have the benefit of um one of my colleagues had been shortlisted the year before and so she very kindly shared her submission with me and and that looking at that was like oh actually this is completely different to I think how I would have written it and it was because I could see straight away, again, it was getting that personality in. It wasn't about what she had done so much as, you know, this is who she is. And, and I really drew from that to go, actually, you know, that's what I need to be showing in this submission. Like, it can't just be about the work that I do. It's got to be about who am I as a person and, and you know, that sort of more depth and colour to it. Yeah, I love that who am I as a person and I think that's kind of shining through from both the judges and yourselves both of you it's about people it's about journey rather than just doing things doing things well so Fiona have you got anything to add to that um I totally agree I think it's um so I I think this being able to ask questions particularly to the judges is probably going to be really useful if you are planning to write an application um I had entered other things before, but someone else had written the entry and then I'd kind of fact checked it. Um, and the feedback that I got on one of them, I don't think it was made in Manchester. I think it was a prolific North one, but was- oh, around... You can't say, I'm joking. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> you can edit it out of the recording. <laughs> That's fine, I'm joking. Um, but the feedback was something that I could have actually, if I had written it, I would have included that information. So going back to the tip at the beginning, you're definitely the best person to write it because you've got the um, you've got the inside knowledge that is basically why you should win. No one else can really give that. Um, and the other thing that I learned, I would say, is I mean, sorry if this is repetitive, but it's really that personality element. I'd written something before 
and I did the kind of school thing of point evidence explanation and you you lose anything that's going to engage a judge I think um I've also done some judging recently and there's some entries that I found really exciting that the actual subject hasn't been exciting um and when I was put forward for the MEMA I was luckily my my role was in a very exciting industry so I worked for the Spirit of Manchester Distillery so it's a it's a good brand good story um but I having judged I've seen entries about really exciting subjects that have been really dull um and I think Alison said some people maybe don't put that effort into the um application that they could have and kind of have lost sight of the person reading it at the end so even if you've got a really exciting job or a really exciting entry don't rest on that um because it it's the way you tell the story that will really kind of bring it through and just because you are likely to be competing with someone who um potentially has a more exciting role in a more exciting business that doesn't mean their entry will or should win um but it's easy to get lost in that I think um especially if you've got a very kind of consumer friendly brand um Rebecca's saying about a, a niche type of law not everyone's going to get that so the only way to to bring that through is with the personality and the right sort of context yeah and then just on that point like people um so so my area of law is uh, it's not particularly you know it's commercial law and when I was getting people to look at my um my entry my a friend of mine just said she's like you you could be up against someone who's done this really um you know ex not exciting but really interesting like human rights case that has implications for the society you know and it's like and it's the so what so and and really drawing that out from what I was doing because I do NHS work but it's like commercial stuff it's not um you know what people think of as you know claims and things like that and so it was the so what you know and, and it links into that social value point as well is is you know what are the actual yes it's all well and good that you're you know working on all these transactions and doing all these things which are great for your client but what does that mean more broadly and you know is there something your know, story you can tell about the impact that you've had um to you know perhaps manchester the business community or, or something more wider than just something that's generating fees for your firm yeah sorry i'm just making notes of all these as we go through because i'm also learning um, so moving on now to the interview stage so um as mentioned before you have 15 minutes um so what exactly should you expect in those 15 minutes uh well chris said don't be nervous but i definitely was um so i think prepare to just feel nervous for the first couple of minutes and then you you really do relax into it a bit all the judges on on the panel interview that i did were really lovely they were really interested i mean as both judges have said they've gone through a lot of entries to get the shortlist um probably because your entry is interesting so they were engaged that it didn't feel like I had to obviously you have to impress them because they're judges but it was them digging more rather than impress us if that makes sense um so I think show the passion show your passion for it talk about how you impacted it, how the what the wider impact was, um, and how you specifically made what happened happen, or how that that was done by you and couldn't have been done by anyone else. So show how you were innovative, or how you showed initiative and approached something differently. Um, and I found that talking from that perspective led to more questions that might not necessarily have been the four or five that had been prepared um and I think adding that level of interest in you probably wins points with the judges great yeah. to add Rebecca um yeah I mean I, I'm not gonna lie and say I wasn't nervous I was nervous but I think the the, the thing to remember is you know, it's 
you're talking about you and you are your subject expert like there you know you are being asked to talk about yourself which I know we all find it difficult but actually you know if you can get yourself into that mindset of say you are your subject expert and just being you know yourself and bringing that enthusiasm and passion for what it is that you do and get that across then actually it's quite easy to talk for 15 minutes and and you know to to have those questions I mean I know that in in the sort of preparation they send you a um some information to to prepare for the interview and it says you know your submission inside out and I think that that can lead you to think you're going to be asked questions on your submission which isn't necessarily the case and I think that in terms of the preparation it's what what are the key things in your submission that you want to get across but not spending all your time like the judges have already seen that so it's it's really adding more to that without you know bringing in loads of different information the example you know it's it's not bringing in new things but it's taking them further on that journey of what you've already told them and you know if you can do that in in the interview then even when you are um you know the questions might not be necessarily about your submission but they give you an opportunity to as they bring in more I just remember in the interview I was asked a question that because I had sort of prepared in in that I thought well what are the questions that are going to ask you know sort of very standard generic questions that they might ask about my submission like you know what would it mean if you won this award or um you know where do you see yourself in five years time those type of questions and then I had one that completely caught me off guard because I just hadn't even thought about it and I, t- I took a moment to answer and then I gave an answer that was just that you know this is the first thing that's come into my head but I think that that actually you know shows authenticity you know even if you don't you know you're not expected to have a prepared answer but if you can just go with well actually this is you know my my gut response to that my you know and it, and, and kind of go with it again you're showing more of your personality and, and more about yourself and that authenticity to the judges yeah, I um, I agree. I there was I can't remember what it was, but there was one question, and my instant thought was, I'm I don't know how to answer that. So there's the knee jerk response where you could end up kind of going off on a mad Digging tangent. A hole. But if you, yeah, waffling, which I definitely do. Um, but then I'd say just. The whole way through, remember to kind of take a minute, listen to the question, don't blur out the stuff that you have. Even if you don't over-prepare, there'll be stuff that you think you're going to want to say. But take a minute, breathe, listen to the question properly, and then it doesn't matter if you've not pre-prepared an answer. You do know you know it, like Rebecca said. There's no one who knows it better. Um, and it might not be on your application, I think the the question, one of the questions that really stumped me was, why do you want to win this award? Um, so I would say that is probably a question you'll get asked if you get to interview stage. Um, and because it would be good, it feels like the instant response when you've not prepared for it. Um, or it did for me, I was like, um, oh, it would just, it would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> Um, I don't know I just didn't I suppose I didn't think about what what it would actually mean so um, I think in writing your application and in the interview that will help to actually think about why you want it Um, yeah and just on that did you both do any preparation beforehand um, or did you kind of just come and hope for the best in terms of the interview or just oh, sorry in terms of the interview yeah. yeah yeah so I did I did do some preparation and say I, I read my submission I thought about what are the questions that I could be asked and actually that one of you know what why should you win this was one that I thought well <laughs> they might ask it in some way so I did I did sort of prepare for that and and I did think about you know because it's in, in preparing for it I thought well I've got to go further then well, I just think I should win, you know, like that's, you know, what, what, what do you, why, you know, what is your, your response on that? And it's thinking in advance, what, what is the reason, you know, what does this mean for me? What does it mean for, 
my team, my firm, you know, uh, the people I work with, or, you know, the work that I'm doing with, um, you know, charities or whatever it is that is, is your thing that, you know, you're bringing into your application. Think about what it means wider than just, well, you know, I think I should win because I'm brilliant and wonderful. <laughs> like not, not that you, you know, going to say that in an interview, but you, it, it's thinking more about what, what does it mean more broadly? Yeah, I um, I definitely agree. I think it's easy when you've got to write a longish application and you've got to set aside time for that and then you've got the nerves of the interview and people are asking you about like, oh, are you, are you excited for your interview? Are you nervous? What are they going to ask you if you read your application? It's easy to lose sight of what the actual process is all going towards and even being shortlisted is so exciting. Um it's quite nice to just take a step back and go, why am I doing this? What does it mean for me? And like you said, my the company and the work I can do in the future. Um, in terms of preparation, I am really bad for over-preparing. So I didn't actually reread my submission, um, which in the five minutes before I thought, oh my God, I'm going to print it out and have it in front of me. And I'm really glad that I didn't. Um, obviously, knew, I'd written it, so I obviously knew what it was about. Um, but I'm I'm really glad that I didn't because I think I did get to give a different side of it rather than having it fresh in my mind and regurgitating the stuff I'd put in the application. That had been a few weeks or maybe, I can't remember the period between submitting the application and doing the interview, but there's quite a there's a decent amount of time so I'd had even more time to reflect on it and probably came to it from a slightly different perspective to how I'd approached writing it so I suppose it all depends on how you like to prepare but for me I think I would have had the exact words I'd written occasion kind of running around my head so knowing that I was confident in what I'd already written not reading it again I think was quite beneficial to me yeah great thank you and then finally to you both um how has winning a Made in Manchester award and um, provided you with a springboard in your career so I know Fiona you've gone self-employed you've now got your own business from what you were doing before so how's it all helped um so I'd say first thing it helped so going going solo has been something I'd wanted to do for quite a long time and winning the award definitely gave me a boost in confidence um that recognition was a a really great kind of wake-up call of like all the all the times that you sit and you have imposter syndrome and you think oh what am I doing or I can't do this to have the recognition uh, from the MEMA and being able to talk through it in an application and then in an interview it made it made me feel like really proud of what I'd done um so I think that recognition gave me a boost in confidence but then it's also massively raised my profile which I I can't believe how how much like a couple of I went to an event a few weeks ago and um a student came up to me and went oh, I follow you on LinkedIn. I was like, oh, right, cool. And he was like, you won an award, didn't you? I was like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, but it it was really, it was nice. He was like, oh, I want to get into hospitality. Um, I'm doing events, but I followed you because you've won like this professional award, but you work within the hospitality sector. And for, I mean, I, I never even... I, I didn't think I'd done anything that would have reached students studying events, um, but he he knew about the award. Um, and then being self-employed, it's also a nice sort of thing to put into my credentials of I, I've worked with these people and I've done this and I've done this, but I've also been recognised with an award. Um, it, does, it does really mean something to a lot of people, especially from, um, from MEMA, it's people know of it it's like really well publicized and there's been nice support from from kind of the team as well so I think it's good from a networking and connections point of view yeah it's it's been it's been good
It's an amazing success story there. You're getting noticed. People stop you down Market Street for autographs. Uh, Rebecca, how about yourself? Have you had any anything like that? Um, so I've not gone self-employed or anything like that. But um, yeah, it is that. I mean, it, it's sort of a credibility point. And actually, it's something that I talked about in my interview was that um, you know part of the reason why I wanted to win the award is because the um, so the area that I practice in doesn't get a lot of recognition. You know, we do have a you know, corporate team who are always winning awards and doing big deals and everything else. And, and no one really talks about what we do. And so it, it was, it's that both, you know, profile raising within the, you know, my own firm, not just for me, but for my team, um, but also wider than that. And it's, it, it was really about, you know, I guess, being able to say to to other people in the team, you know, look, we don't just go without recognition. Actually, you know, I've won this award, but it could be you next year. And and you know, even within the office, um, with the the applications coming up, up when we talk about it, it's like it gives a really good buzz of like actually, you know, we, we're as a a community of you know our, our office in Manchester that we've got really great things happening. We've got really great people and. And it's just more like evidence of that um, beyond just, you know, an, an individual accolade. So, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely, and, you know, the things like, you know, being able to put it on LinkedIn, having it on like my email signature and stuff. And it is a talking point when you, you know, you're talking to people. And, um, and I think what's really nice as well is because it's a, um, you know, for me being a lawyer, but it's it's a non-legal award. And so actually it's, it's recognised more widely than, just you know yeah. the sort of I guess the niche kind of sector like legal awards it, it is that you know when I go to um pro Manchester events and things I can I can talk to you and everyone knows what what it is and, and what I'm talking about so it is a great talking point in that respect amazing thank you um so I just want to close today by asking all four of you if, if Alison's still there if we can bring her back um just one final question so if if you could give people one takeaway tip today um what would it be so maybe if we come to you first chris um well i think well hopefully we've given people quite a few pointers today um i just think if i think it's probably less at the interview stage more at the submission stage um i think what Rebecca said in terms of get writing in the third person, I think it's a really, really good idea. But then get the guy or whoever sits next to you in your office or at work to um, to just read it and then sort of tell you the bits that they know you're probably better than most people because they probably spend quite a lot of time with you in a day. Get them to tell you the bits that you've not put in, that they will talk about, you know, you as a person, your personality. Um just don't miss out. And we've all talked about, you know, shining and coming to light and showing your personality. Just make sure that when you're doing your submission, you you ask people around you to highlight some of the things that, that why would they expect you to win the award? That'd be a really good question to ask, you know, the guy or the person who's sat next to you. Great. Um, Rebecca, do you want to go next? Um. Yeah, so I feel like it's too. So I, I think it's that point for the interview, which is to say you are the expert on you, so don't don't be nervous. Um, and yeah, it, just in, and enjoy the process. Yeah. Alison, do you want to take the next one and then we'll close with you, Fiona? I think it's just having in mind how we've, we've, we've all made different recommendations as to how to prepare I think the interview hopefully by the time you get to the interview you you've already got sorted in your head the things that you want to say but I would say don't underestimate the time it will take you to prepare and go through the different steps that we've outlined because you also need time to to take on board any advice that you're given by colleagues reflect you know revise what you're doing so you know I, I think just get started collect your examples think about it but be prepared to get input from other people leave it alone for a while come back to it so yeah get get started amazing thank you and fiona final word from you um i would say that you've probably done the hard bit if you've got something worth entering the application is just being able to talk 
about what you've done. Um, so if if you're doing your job well enough to be putting yourself forward for an award, that is that's the hard bit, and it's really easy to over kind of procrastinate and spend a long time wondering how you should phrase it but just get I think just get started try not to procrastinate too much start with bullet points or start with a voice note about it um and then just kind of self-edit put your personality in um and tell the story but stop kind of don't overthink it just get started on it and the rest will come it's it's what you it's what you know best really really good tips thank you so much um well that draws us to a close today so um i just want to finish off by saying thank you to all of our panelists for being here today and for giving the time and um, i hope everybody that's joined today and everyone that's catching the recording has got some really good tips um so we hope to see lots of nominations coming in um for the memers so nominations are open to, until the 30th of october uh, and the shortlist will then be revealed at the end of november and um, the actual made in manchester awards are on thursday the 1st of february um i definitely recommend booking the friday off if it was anything like earlier this year um but it is a really really good night so get the nominations in get the table to get the tickets and um we'll see you all at the next future pro manchester event thank you <laughs>